2022 is going to be over before we know it, which means it's time to get your 2023 calendars ordered. What would you say if I told you that you could get a calendar with some of your favorite independent true crime podcasts, including Eel Crime? Pre-order your copy at podcastcalendars.com and get $5 off your order by using our promo code OLDCRIMERS. That's O-L-D-E-C-R-I-M-E-R-S. And if you order before November 30th, you can get an additional 10% off. That's podcastcalendars.com, code OLDCRIMERS. Don't miss your chance to spend May with us, and we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. So, full disclosure. Oh my god. Maddie just got back from being at our parents this weekend with my oldest, Mm -hmm. and Smooch is being extremely clingy. So yes. you will be hearing lots of cat noises in the background. <laughs> and I already know I'm not going to be able to cut them out and make them go away. So here's some added mood music. Right. Here's some scientifically proven soothing sounds. Yeah, feel good sounds. Here's your serotonin for the day. Thanks, Smooch. My senior cat, Smooch. Anyway, we're going to be talking about the Match Girl Strike of 1888. Oh, okay. Are you familiar with this one? I've heard of it. Okay. I'm sure I will be reminded of it as soon as you go into it. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know about this. Sounds good. I have a lot of sources this week. Mm -hmm. Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2021 All That's Interesting article by Genevieve Carlton. 2021 Historic UK article by Jessica Brain, 2021 History Extra article by Dr. Louise Raw, 2020 Spartacus Educational article by John Simkin, 2018 The Conversation article by Catherine Best, 1888 The Paul Mall Gazette article, 1888 The Times article, BBC History, English Heritage, The Matchsticks Girls 1888 website, two articles from the National Archives, and two Wikipedia listings. And I will have links to all of these articles in the show notes. I love that one of them was Paul Mall. Isn't that a cigarette brand? Yeah, but it was a newspaper way back in the day. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, Haha, the cigarette company is talking about the matchstick strike. <laughs> big tobacco. You Put shut your v- face, big tobacco. Putting their smoky little hands on it. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes or over on our link tree to get started today. Loosely used as the main plot of the second Enola Holmes movie on Netflix, today we'll be discussing the real history of the British matchstick girls who went on strike to fight against the poor working conditions and health risks they faced every day in Victorian England. Good luck. That's awesome. Yeah. Many of the women involved in the strike worked at Bryant in May, which opened in 1861. The bulk of them were Irish immigrants who resided in filthy housing, with many of them sharing a small room, living in extreme poverty amongst vermin, after spending long hours making matches, receiving little pay for their troubles. You're not, you're not going to like this one. 
I'm no. just I'm just saying. It's gonna make mm. you mad. Okay. The women would start work at 6.30 a.m. and work 14-hour days, six days a week, in the Fairfield Road bow area of the east end of London, packing up matches. Mm -hmm. They were often described as a, quote, rough set of girls, end quote, and, quote, the lowest strata of society, end quote. Cute. Mm -hmm. Think of them every time you light up, jerks. Many lower-class women were just 13 when they started working in factories, and some of the workers were as young as six years old. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they didn't have regulations back then, did they? Yeah. Child labor laws didn't come into effect until after this. Jeez. They would have to stand all day, with two scheduled breaks, and any bathroom breaks that took place outside of those two scheduled times would be docked out of their pay. Awesome. Great. Who needs to have biology interfere with everyday life, you know? Mm -hmm. Breathing is secondary. Mm -hmm. Worker compensation had different rates depending on the job performed. Those who filled the frames with matches received one shilling, or four pounds today, per every 100 frames they completed. Cool. Cutters who split the extra-long matchsticks that were dipped at both ends, received about two and three-quarters pence, or a pound, today, for every three boxes filled. Okay. And workers who packed the boxes received one shilling and nine pence, or seven pounds today, for every 100 boxes they wrapped. Workers under the age of 14 just earned four shillings a week. Or around 16 pounds today. No matter what they did? Yeah. Okay. The women would be exposed to a deadly compound known as white phosphorus. Ooh. Yeah. That was added to the tips of the matches in place of the red compound, allowing users to, quote, strike anywhere, end quote, to light the match. This highly toxic compound was the cause of a degenerative illness known as osteonecrosis, or fossy jaw, which would literally cause necrosis of the jawbone, or in simpler terms, cause the jaw to rot, and it was a form of bone cancer. Yeah. It's interesting that it, like, focuses mostly on the jaw. Yeah. Like, why? Probably because they were inhaling. Yeah. Like, it was coming in through the mouth. But you would assume it would, like, it would eventually affect other pieces of your skull bone, but that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, eventually it would. Yeah. <sighs> okay. The first recorded case was noted in 1838, afflicting a Viennese matchstick girl. Just a few years later in 1844, so five years later, mm-hmm. a doctor in Vienna recorded 22 additional cases of phosphorus necrosis of the jaw. It was estimated that over the years... of workers that were exposed to white phosphorus fumes went on to develop fossy jaw. That's a lot. 11%. They had to have been mostly in like the dipping portion of it or something. Mm -hmm. Ingesting the tiniest amount of this chemical compound would induce vomiting, which was just the tip of the iceberg. Mm Mm-hmm. Poisoning symptoms would start with a simple toothache and swollen face before it would start to rot the lower jaw. As a result, pea-sized pieces of bone would pass through the gums in, quote, putrid abscesses, end quote, filled not only with bone, but the most noxious-smelling pus that made staying in the afflicted person's presence unbearable. Oh. The next progression would be facial disfigurement and eventually death. How quick was this? It depended. As you can imagine, this disease was extremely painful. Not only that, but it often spreads to the brain, which leads to a particularly horrific death unless the jaw is removed. Even if the women had the surgery which at that time would have been well out of their price range based on their paltry wages, any sort of prolonged life prognosis wasn't guaranteed. 
the firm's only precaution against Fossey Jaw was to sack anyone who exhibited a swollen face, or they required the women to have all of their teeth removed. Which would be too much for them to handle anyway. Yep. There was even a case of a pregnant woman refusing to have her teeth pulled, fearing it would cause a miscarriage, and due to her refusal, she was fired. Awesome. Yep. Great. In an article from the Daily Chronicle, it noted of Fossey Jaw, quote, Phosphorus poisoning is one of the most terrible and painful diseases to which the workers are subject. Last month, a man named Cornelius Lean, who had been working at Bryant and Mays, died. An inquest was held, and it was found that death was due to phosphorus poisoning. This led to inquiries being made, and it was discovered that no less than 17 cases had occurred, none of which had been reported, end quote. Wow. Yeah, I'm looking it up, and it's wicked. Mm -hmm. You're probably thinking to yourself, how could employers get away with this? That's because it was the Industrial Revolution, and well before mm -hmm. safety standards were introduced to create safe working environments for the people who toiled away at the factories. After all, <laughs> there was always an abundance of people able and willing to work if someone should get sick or pass away. Mm -hmm. Oh, Shahu? Yep. In addition to the health concerns and poor working conditions, there was more to fear. Large fines. Coming to work late would cost you five pence, or almost two pounds. Dropping or accidentally lighting a match. Having dirty feet, because many worked barefoot because they couldn't afford shoes. Ah, oh, jeez. Having an untidy workstation, not to mention talking to your peers, could cost you three pence, or about a one pound today. So for those 14-year-old girls, it would be almost, it'd be three quarters of their paycheck for the, that week. Mm-hmm. Wow. The women also had to pay the boys who brought them the frames from the drying ovens, because the men were the ones that dipped the matchsticks, mm. and then they would give, they would have to bring the frames to the girls for, like, the cutting and everything. So they would have to pay the men for bringing them the frames from the drying ovens because they weren't allowed to get them themselves. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. But there's more. Of course there is. The girls also had to provide their own supplies to work, such of as course. brushes, glue, mm -hmm. and paint. And yep. they would also have to pay for the frames they used to box up the matches. Hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. One girl was fined for working on a machine to prevent it from cutting her hand. After her fine, she was told, quote, never mind your fingers, end quote. Great. They were just like, don't worry about it. You don't need them. Not long after this, a fellow worker who used the machine had a finger cut off and as a result was unable to continue working and became penniless. Perfect. Great. And it wasn't just the dangerous machines that they had to be cautious of. Foremen were known to physically and verbally abuse workers on a regular basis as well. Of course. Why not? Yeah. Because they're considered to be less than the product they're making. Mm -hmm. Is that Willie that I'm hearing breathing heavily? Or is that Chief? Chief is snoring that hard. <laughs> So if you also hear heavy breathing, it's Chief snoring. Yeah, that's how he snores. He just goes, ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to sad stuff. Yeah. The workers spent their days taking sticks made from poplar or pine wood, which they would dip in a solution of white phosphorus, antimony sulfide, and potassium chlorate on both ends. This was despite the fact that red phosphorus had been discovered in the 1840s, making the use of the more poisonous and volatile white phosphorus unnecessary. In one day, one person might make as many as 10 million matches. That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Like, it's impressive, but I hate it. Yeah. Men and boys were the ones in charge of dipping the sticks. While the women and girls would take over the remainder of the processing and packing, 
which included cutting the matches, packing them, and tying them into bundles of 12. Fun fact. Hmm. Bryant and May was just one of 25 match factories in England, and of those, only two of them chose to not use white phosphorus in the production of their matches. Of course. Because who cares? They're not Mm -hmm. the ones messing with the toxic substance. It's probably cheaper. Mm Mm-hmm. It was. It was cheaper to use the white phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Enter Annie Besant. Annie was born Annie Woods in London on October 1st, 1847. Her childhood wasn't a happy one. Following her Mm -hmm. father's death when she was five, her mother had her friend Ellen Marriott raise Annie in her stead to ensure she could receive an education. Annie got married to Frank Besant when she was 20 in 1867. Oh, late. Yeah. Although the pair had two children together, Annie's growing anti-religious views put a wedge in her relationship with her husband, culminating in them legally separating just six years into their marriage in 1873. I mean, would you believe in God if that was your fate? It kind of became an issue because her husband was a clergyman. So. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of... That's kind of why that happened. (laughs) Your work is trash. Your belief is trash. (laughs) Get out of my house. Around the time of her separation from her husband, Annie took up work as an editor alongside Charles Bradlaugh at the Weekly National Reformer, a publication that focused on topics like trade unions, national education, birth control, and women's right to vote. Whoa, how liberal. Right? Super liberal at the time. Mm -hmm. In 1877, Annie was tried for obscene libel due to her efforts Hmm. to teach the poor women of the East End contraceptive methods. Yeah. After narrowly escaping prison, she became a member of the National Secular Society, whose main tenet was that of free thought, and she also joined the Fabian Society, a noted socialist organization. I was just going to say, she's... She's about as extremely left, quote unquote, <laughs> as you can be, which is so funny because it's like, yeah, human rights. Yeah. Crazy. Annie made a point of attending several workers' demonstrations in the pursuit of better working conditions. And it was at a Fabian Society meeting on June 15th, 1888, that she became aware of the deplorable conditions at Bryant and Mays and the plight of the women who worked there. The women who worked there noted that the conditions were detrimental to their health as a result of the phosphorus fumes, not to mention the wages were barely enough to feed themselves, let alone keep a roof over their heads. Yep. Annie made a point to interview a handful of the women employed by the firm, and what followed was an expose she had published in the June 23, 1888 edition of political paper The Link, titled, quote, White slavery in London, end quote. <laughs> Ooh. Edgy. In the expose, she stated that the working conditions were similar to a quote unquote prison house, and the girls were little more than quote unquote white wage slaves. Considering how profitable and powerful match production companies were at the time, this was a bold move to call out the injustices taking place in the Bryant and May factory. Mm-hmm. I bet, because, like, that would be, like, you going after GE right now. Mm Mm-hmm. That's something that they use for everything. Yep. An excerpt states, quote, Born in slums, driven to work while still children, undersized because underfed, oppressed because helpless, flung aside as soon as worked out, who cares if they die or go on to the streets provided only that Bryant and May shareholders get their 23%, and Mr. Theodore Bryant can erect statutes and buy parks. Girls are used to carry boxes on their heads until the hair is rubbed off, and the young heads are bald at 15 years of age. Country clergymen with shares in Bryant and Mays draw down on your knee your 15-year-old daughter, pass your hand tenderly over the silky clustering curls, rejoice in the dainty beauty of the thick, shiny tresses." End quote. That would have been pretty powerful for some, if anybody read it. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
At the time of the publication of the expose, the firm was under the control of the sons of one of its founders, William Bryant. The other founder was Francis May, both of whom were Quakers. Oh, that checks out. The Quakers were the worst. William was a huge player in both domestic and export markets, not to mention a household name. By acting as a monopoly, the firm was able to drive wages down so far that they were lower than they had been in 1877, ten years earlier. That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. In her article, Annie noted that one 16-year-old matchstick factory worker only earned four shillings a week, or about 16 pounds. And after paying her rent, she could only afford bread to eat for every meal. Yeah, that would not be sustainable for her at all. No. Infuriated, the factory owners attempted to force their female employees to sign a document stating that they were content with their jobs. They also threatened to sue Annie for libel. Of course. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's super accurate, but like, how dare you? It's super not true. And look, we have this document of all these signatures proving that they're super happy with their jobs. Yeah. Ignore the bloodstains. Mm -hmm. The firm decided to make an example of a girl they believed had spoken to Annie, a, quote, pale little person in black, end quote, who was quite popular with her coworkers. She was Mm. sacked after she was asked to fill boxes of matches in a particular way according to how the machine cut them which caused an increased charge of electricity. When she refused, she was dismissed. So basically it made that particular area extremely dangerous to work in because if there was a spark, bad things could happen. Yeah. It could have arced. It would have caught fire. She would have been electrocuted. She could have been burnt. Yep. Mm -hmm. Both. Both (laughs) at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately after her dismissal, 1,500 women and girls between the ages of 15 and 20, led by Sarah Chapman, walked out and officially went on strike around July 2nd, 1888. They quickly assembled pick lines at the gates and elected six women to note their terms. The reinstatement of their colleague, the end of fines, and a proper dining room where the women could safely eat away from the toxic phosphorus particles. In response, the firm threatened to sack all of the strikers and replace them with Scottish workers from Glasgow. Cute. Mm-hmm. Sarah Chapman, the leader of the strike, was born the fifth of seven children on October 31st, 1862, to parents Samuel Chapman and Sarah Ann Mackenzie. She spent her childhood living in Mile End and stayed in London's East End most of her life. When she was 19, she joined her mother and elder sister as a matchmaking machinist at Bryant and May. At the time of the strike, she was a well-established member of the workforce. Four days after the start of the strike, Annie was approached by three of the matchwomen. In a letter written by one of the strikers that was sent to Annie at her home, it reads in part, quote, Dear lady, they have been trying to get the poor girls to say it is all lies, that has been printed and to sign a paper. We will not sign. We hope you will not get into any trouble on our behalf, as what you have spoken is quite true. End quote. The strike committee that was voted into place included Mrs. Mary Knowles, Mrs. Mary Cummings, Sarah Chapman, Alice Francis, Kate Sclater, Mary Driscoll, Jane Wakeling, and Eliza Martin. On July 8th, the strikers held their first meeting on Mile End Waste, where they were joined by Harry Hobart, who was a Social Democrat Federation activist. Mm -hmm. He suggested they form a strike register, and by July 11th, over 700 girls, boys, men, and women had signed up. Nice. 56 strikers paid the House of Commons a visit to share their stories two days later on July 10th, in the company of Annie Besant. Twelve of the strikers were even given an opportunity to meet with the MPs Robert Cunningham Graham and Charles Coneybear. The women did all that they could to gain attention, and attention they received. Mm-hmm. 
they were often recognized by their bright clothes, high-heeled boots, fringed hairstyles, and large hats trimmed with the largest feathers money could buy. How did... I don't know how they afforded these. Yeah, I didn't... I was just going to say, like, I don't know. women couldn't get shoes. So, like, do you think it was a tactic by, like, the political dudes? Like, or maybe people, like, donated the clothes? I don't know. Because, as you'll hear, like, later on in my notes, people were very sympathetic to their cause. So I'm wondering if people... Okay. Did, it had yeah. to have been because they're I mean if they can only eat bread and like not afford shoes and suddenly they have like these crazy modern haircuts and super nice hats and dresses and heeled boots mm-hmm. it has to be donations either that or it's something that they had squirreled away from who who knows I don't know yeah but it said you would know a matched it girl by the quote freedom of her walk shrillness of her laugh and number of her friends, end quote. Nice. Evenings in the East End of London would be filled with their songs, such as Knocked em in the Old Kent Road and ta ra ra boom Dier." Ah, nice. That's the only one I knew of those two. After the first week of the strike, the matchstick factory, quote, was lying idle, end quote, as 1,100 mm-hmm. of its employees paraded the streets in protest. The women had gone several days without pay, but they worked together to support one another, pawning goods and lending one another what they needed. Nice. The public was extremely sympathetic to their plight and would cheer them on and provide them with support. Annie even worked to set up an appeal fund to help support the striking women, gaining a number of donations, including substantial support from big organizations such as the London Trades Council. Nice. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Author Dr. Louise Ra, who did extensive research on the Matchstick Girls, noted that as the accusations about Bryant and May went public, many criticized them for their hypocrisy. Hmm. Quote, Messrs. Bryant and May are well-known liberals and have paraded their liberalism before the world. More than one shareholder is a well-known member of Parliament, who profess to champion the cause of the poor and the oppressed. How could they meet their constituents with large dividends in their pockets when their employees in the east of London existed on next to starvation wages? End quote. No, it was starvation wages. Mm-hmm. It wasn't next to. It was. Sorry to tell you. Yeah, especially if you had one of the lowest paying positions there. Right, and if you had anyone to support. Yeah. It wasn't long before having any association with Bryant and Mays became a mark of poor taste. Politicians and clergymen who once held shares in the firm quickly sold them to distance themselves from the scandal. I wonder who they sold them to. I don't I don't know. Them. Probably. This was okay, this is a fun fact. It's said that the striking women even earned the dubious honor of gaining the attention of Jack the Ripper after they received a threatening letter. But this is likely an elaborate hoax. Yeah, that makes sense. He was more into working women of a different profession. Yeah. On July 15th, funds were distributed from the strike funds to the strikers. The following day, the London Trades Council met with the directors of Bryant and May to discuss the strikers' demands. As a result of all the negative press, on July 17th, the owners and shareholders of the factory set up a compromise just a few weeks after the start of the strike, Mm -hmm. and unbelievably, all of the demands were agreed to. I mean, they weren't that big of a deal. Like, do you want me to give you a cookie for giving a place to eat? Yeah. Which included, all fines should be abolished. Mm Mm-hmm. All deductions for paint, brushes, stamps, etc. should be put an end to. Mm -hmm. The three shillings should be restored to the packers. The pennies should be restored or an equivalent advantage given in the system of payment of the boys who did the racking. Mm -hmm. All grievances should be laid directly before the firm ere any hostile action was taken. 
and all the girls were to be taken back. Okay. The firm also agreed to provide a room for meals away from the room where work was performed, and that barrows would be provided for the easy transport of boxes instead of the girls having to carry them on their heads. So wheelbarrows would be provided. Seriously? Yep. The fact that this had to be like a compromise Mm -hmm. is insane. Yep. In the July 18th, 1888 edition of the Pall Mall Gazette, it published an article on the front page that stated, quote, a great and notable victory. Quote, today we have to rejoice over a victory as complete as it was unexpected. The match girls have ob- obtained the concession of every demand which they made when they came out on strike, and what seemed one of the most desperate of forlorn hopes has been crowned by a brilliant victory. The story of the strike is full of hope for the future, illustrating as it does the immense power that lies in mere publicity. There is nothing like letting in the light for stopping the cruelties that are done in the dark corners of the earth, end quote. Nice. Bryant and May also recognized the Union of Women Matchmakers when they officially formed on July 27, 1888. By the end of 1888, it rebranded as the Matchmakers Union and was open to both men and women. Nice. The inaugural meeting of the Union of Women Matchmakers took place on July 27, 1888, where 12 women were elected. On August 4th, Enrollment of union members was open, and 468 unionists joined. Dang. Following the successful resolution of their strike, several others took place later on, including the Great Dock Strike of 1889. The matchstick women formed the largest union of women and girls in the country. In fact, records show that a number of dockers spoke with the matchstick women after they formed their union to get a advice on how to proceed. In a staggering statistic, by 1890, the average life expectancy of a member of the working class was 27. Oh my god. Not only that, but half of the children born to the poor would die before they reached the age of five. That makes sense based on what they were ingesting and breathing and Their living conditions, yep. The demands for better working conditions were ultimately met, for the most part, 20 years later in 1906. Great. It was then that the white phosphorus that was used in the factory was made illegal in matchstick production. Mm. As a result of this legal act, Fossy Jaw was quickly eliminated in the UK following an act that was passed by the House of Commons in 1910. So they met all of the demands up to changing the materials they were using to make the matchsticks. Yeah, I mean, they didn't ask for that. Yeah. Loophole. Gross. Meanwhile, across the pond in the United States, a punitive tax was placed on white phosphorus matches that made the production so expensive it wasn't even worth making them. As more and more unions were formed to fight for decent working conditions and wages, it formed the inspiration that would start the modern labor movement and the eventual forming of the Labor Party. The matchstick girls provided the spark (laughs) that set off Mm. a wave of unions for unskilled workers in a movement known as New Unionism. Nice. The matchstick girls' legacy has lasted so long that plays and musicals have been written about them, during the Mm -hmm. 1960s and are still performed to this day. In regards to Sarah Chapman, she went on to marry a cabinet maker named Charles Henry Dearman in December of 1891 at the age of 29. They had their first child, which they named Sarah Elsie, the following year in 1892, before they moved to Bethnal Green, where she and her husband would go on to have five more children. Dang. Yeah. Her husband passed in 1922, and Sarah passed away on November 27th, 1945, at the age of 83. She, along with five other elderly people, was buried in an unmarked grave in Manor Park Cemetery. Do they give a reason why it's unmarked? Just vandalism? 
That was during World War II, so I'm wondering if it was uh, just a matter of they couldn't yeah. make markers for everyone. Yeah. That's just my thought there. Lastly, on July 5th, 2022, a plaque was dedicated to the Match Girls. The blue plaque is on the Bryant and Mays factory exterior and is recognized as an English heritage site. The plaque reads, quote, The Match Girls strike took place here at the Bryant and May Works in 1888, end quote. Nice. And that's the story of the London Matchstick Girls. Great group of ladies, really horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And if you think that Fosse Jaw was gross, I am going to have examples of it on social, just showing like their cheeks and... You can show the jaw bones, like the teeth. And like the dis stuff. the disfigurement of the face following a surgery. But mm -hmm. it was it was not pretty and not no. something that I would wish on my worst enemy. Nope. It was it's very similar to what the Radium Girls went through, if you are familiar mm -hmm. with the Radium Girl story. Yep. Radium jaw. Yep. Are you interested in tales from the past? Stories about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Devious acts that show the depths to which some would descend to get what they want. As well as stories from the battlefields highlighting true heroism. And through the gleaming ages, these lads will take their stand. By the side of Britain's hero. Your name is Trip. You advance up these stairs, and closer to me, I will blow your brains out. Take that in the name of the insulted women of England. Then listen to the Backtracker History Show with me, Alice, where you'll find a plethora of fascinating true accounts. Some will amaze you, others will shock you. But they're all true, and brought to life by a cast of truly talented voice actors reading out the actual words each character said. You can find the Backtracker History Show wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to www.backtracker.co.uk. On a lighter note, this week's podcast plug <laughs> is the Backtracker History Show, originally aired on Bradley Stoke Radio in Bristol, England. Each week, Alice shares people, places, and events from the past, from tales of pirates and privateers to murderers, tragic accidents to wartime escapades. This podcast has it all. Be sure to tune in, and we'll have a link in the show notes. Nice. It's like a variety show type of thing, where she'll like cool. share a story, she'll do like a this day in history thing, and then she'll also do like a fun word. So it's kind of like a cramp word thing, but not necessarily a Victorian slang term. So, yeah. So it's really fun. Oh. And they're not super long either. So it's yeah. very bingeable. Awesome. What's uh, something good you'd like to share? Oh my God, I've been baking and cooking so much this week and it was awesome. Yeah, your, mac your macarons and cupcakes are pretty good. Yeah, it was my partner's birthday this week. So I got to make birria tacos for the first time. Have you ever had those? Like the stew? No. I so don't even know what those are. <laughs> they're really good. So birria tacos, it's it's like a stew meat. So kind of like a roast beef. Or not roast beef. Like a pot roast. Sorry. Like a pot roast type meat. Like a chuck roast generally. And... You make it with like these peppers and this tomato based broth and all some apple cider vinegar. And it's really, you cook it like all day together. And then you take the meat out, shred it. And then you take everything, take the rest of like the vegetables and stuff, and you blend it so that it's just like a solid, they call it a consomme. And then you get a flour tortilla and you fry it. Lightly, and then you put the meat in and then you dip it in the consomme and you fry it again and then when you eat it you have like queso fresco some cilantro onions 
and then you just dip it in this sauce that you made like the stew and it's freaking delicious and it was really difficult to make at home and it was like the messiest my kitchen has ever been because I, I don't work with a lot of like tomato based stuff a lot mm -hmm. and the grease that tomatoes and like red meat leave mm -hmm. oh man and at one point like I had splashed some of it <laughs> it was just like <laughs> I hate everything <laughs> But then he also gave me a, kind of a tricky cake request because he wanted a coffee-based cake with maple buttercream. Okay. And so I was able to make it, but my, the sponge I make, as you can, like, <laughs> you can attest to because you just had a cupcake of mine, mm -hmm. it's very light mm -hmm. and it's it's not dense so it's very light and soft mm -hmm. and sorry everybody moist <laughs> so moist and then when I added the coffee to it it was even softer Ooh. and then the maple buttercream because you use maple syrup is really heavy mm. and so it was really complicated to build it because the frosting was heavier than the sponge <laughs> so it was like Causing it to smash down. It was a re yeah. It, it I essentially just like started making cake balls because okay. that was the you know future of it. But it was still super delicious. And then when I went to our parents this weekend, your oldest requested macarons. The recipe wasn't quite right. They were pretty ugly looking macarons, but I mean they tasted delicious. Yeah, they were still super good. Then I made cupcakes because my partner had requested more cupcakes when he got when he gets back from drill. So I tried to make a cookie dough based one, and it like you said, it tastes mostly like butter, but yeah. it's like a caramelized butter. So it's really it's really good. Like it's really light and moussey, and yeah, just the frosting is it is literally just like licking a stick of butter. <laughs> like it's just kind of like. Like sugary butter is good. Yeah, I liked it. Not not that I spend time eating butter or anything. No, but you know what, but I, like, you know what I mean. I don't want people to be I like browned, she yeah. eats butter. Weird. I browned, <laughs> I browned butter for this recipe, and when you put it brown butter and buttercream, it's it's such an intense taste mm -hmm. that it's really hard to kind of hide it. So it it I mean it is it's quite literally buttercream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it was good though so yeah I just I really enjoy baking and cooking and I had some pretty nice successes this week so that made me feel good what's something good for you this week Thomas and I watched Wednesday on Netflix oh, yeah. and it was good I liked it I think the actress I just know her last name Ortega yeah she was the perfect Wednesday did an amazing yeah. job. I think they did a fantastic job with the world building and the characters. I thought the writing was good. There were a couple of parts where I was like, that's kind of cheesy. But yeah, I mean, it's the Adams family. So it's, it's going to be a little yeah. cheesy. That's, that's part of the shtick. Mm -hmm. I knew who the baddies were like right away in the first episode. Right. But that's just me, but it was good. <laughs> I would watch it again. I enjoyed watching it. Nice. Now I just need to get back into watching 1899 and finish that. Are you familiar okay. with that one? I've seen it. I've heard it. Like I've I've seen it on Netflix. And I've heard of it, but I, I'm kind of waiting for. I'll let you know when I think when I'm done with it, because I've only watched okay. two episodes. So far, it's intriguing. It's like Titanic meets H.P. Lovecraft at this point in time. Ooh. Okay. Like there's a there's some there's a bunch of mysterious things going on. Yeah. It's this ship. It's one of two ships in this like <laughs> cruise line and one yeah. of the ships had been missing for like 3 months. And then the other steamship that everybody's on, they come across it and that's kind of okay. where it starts. But there's like a lot of different characters, the whole premise is people from different walks of life are on this boat 
and they each have their own unique version for needing to go to america Mm -hmm. so like titanic yeah kind of like titanic and also it it has a little bit of like a lost feel to it Mm -hmm. if you want to throw back to when lost was a big deal so oh yeah Fine. That's kind. Of, that's kind of the vibes I'm getting. But I've only watched the first two episodes, so I need to, I need to finish it. I'll let you know what I think when I finish watching it. Sounds good. If you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation, either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. If you'd like early ad-free content, not to mention some bonus material. Become a member of our Patreon today for as low as a dollar a month. A great way to support the show if you'd like to help out but can't do so financially is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, leave us a rating on Spotify, or really wherever you can leave ratings and reviews. This week's comes from Podchaser from the podcast Know It Some Pod. I apologize if I get that wrong. And they say, this is more than your everyday true crime show. The stories they've chosen to tell are interesting and riveting. (laughs) Definitely tales you haven't heard before and such a great host. Definitely a must-listen podcast. Jesus, smooch. (laughs) She she just rubbed her whole face. She just went full force against the mic. (laughs) I swear I could almost feel that through my headphones. God damn. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Facebook and Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. On TikTok? Of course you are. Follow us at yieldcrimepodcast. I don't know when we're having a tea public sale. I'll note it on yeah. social once I find out. I am, I'm not good. getting the preemptive emails anymore. I don't know what happened. I don't know either. It happens. If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. Well, on that note, <laughs> as always... I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime.